All right, good afternoon. Sean here from Mountains Garage. Today we're going to tear apart this Turbo 400. I'm going to explain the steps ahead of time and then go ahead and do them off camera. It's just easier that way. But for step one, I've already drained it. I'm going to take every nut and bolt on the outside. Going around the case, I'm going to pop out the rear seal. The old cooler lines, the modulator. Everything on the outside, the governor cover and governor. Uh, the tail housing, there's a good tip. You can see the natural grease line starts about down here on the bolts, the six bolts on the tail housing. They're pretty greasy from there down, but the top ones are usually dry aluminum with a steel bolt in them. If you smack them briskly right here, you don't have to hurt a thing, don't hit the case, don't, don't break anything, but you hit it really hard. It'll shock it, and they'll come right out. It won't take the threads out with them. Uh, if you just go ahead and hit them with the gun, you get a 50-50 shot. Most of the time, this will dry. They're pulling the threads out with them. Just save you some work later on. So let me strip off all the outside stuff, and I'll meet up with you again. All right, as promised, we've stripped off all the outside bolts and hardware. I've broken the linkage nut loose, but I'm going to need that to get the linkage out of the case. Because there's a seal you need to change behind that. And where the rooster comb is for the linkage, behind you take the nut off. You have to have the pump out. There's a nail that holds this in, believe it or not. It's an actual nail. It goes to, I'll show you when you take it apart. But this area where the rooster comb rides on the shaft, it's going to be burred up right there. And if you just go ahead and try to get that out of the case, you're going to destroy the case for no good reason. Uh, pump removal. Uh, there's two threaded holes in a Turbo 400 to assist you to get it out. Typically, you don't need it. Usually, I use a pry bar right behind the pressure regulator in the case. You just pop it right out. Sometimes, you've got to assist it if it cocks with the slide hammer. Uh, usually, at this point in the teardown, you've got a pretty good idea of what you bought. I try to ask a few questions before I buy a core transmission, like, why is it out of service? And was it stored inside, more importantly, because it has, if it has water in it, it's junk. Fortunately, this one, while the oil's kind of burnt, it's uh, looking okay so far. Interesting, the pump bolts typically have gaskets under them. It wasn't until the very later years that they used O-rings underneath, and this one had bolts with O-rings. So... We'll have to see. The tag is missing on the side that would identify the year. So it's a crapshoot at this point. At this point in the teardown, I like to remove the front pump, the forward clutch, the direct drum, and the intermediate clutches just to get them out of the way and to get an idea of what I'm dealing with inside for damage. There is a bolt beneath the valve body that goes up into the center support which prevents you from removing the entire gear train out of the back half of the transmission. That's just the order I like to do it. The reason a Turbo 400 is superior to a Turbo 350 is the bolt that actually secures the center support to the case. On a Turbo 350 it is just lugged into the aluminum lugs in the case with a small spring to help it from moving too much and that's why you see a lot of catastrophic failures of a TH350. Like they'll rip the case in half and turn upside down in the car. That's the reason. They're not as power, uh, is able to take as much power as a Turbo 400. All right, we pulled the pots out of the case and spread them out on the bench. Starting with the pump. It looks to be in fine shape. I pulled the five bolts out, split it in half, inspected the surfaces. And other than a new bushing, where the control converter rides on and a new seal that seals the uh, pump to the converter, it'll reassemble nicely. When you reassemble it and put the both halves together with the five bolts before you tighten it, you need to align it. The old hose clamp trick works pretty good. You just tighten around the outside and then go ahead and tighten the five bolts to hold it together. You can also drop it in a case upside down if you got one empty. And uh, this will also serve as to alignment, but it's a lot easier just to have a couple of hose clamps hooked together to large enough to fit around the circumference. Theory of operation. It's pretty handy when you got a manual to reference to tell you what's applied and what isn't in what particular gear. It actually helps when you uh, 
trying to improve the performance of something to know how it works. But you can overhaul carburetors, transmissions, you name it. If you're good at taking things apart and putting them back together, never even know how it works. But it's a lot easier if you spend a little time on theory. The forward clutch is the one with the input shaft. It's not a shifting clutch. It's applied in all forward gears. And most of the time you're going to see a wave plate or a Belleville washer next to the piston. This has got steel pistons. Uh, a lot of them have aluminum ones. The jury's still out which one's better. You see a lot more of these and actually this ring is interchangeable if you want to add more clutches or they want to put in less clutches. They just make this taller but the piston itself is typically the same. You just change this ring. This is already a five clutch and it'll probably be reassembled just like this. There's lip seals in the drum and the piston. Three of them. Standard issue of rebuilding automatic transmissions. You gotta compress the spring pack, take off the snap ring, pop it out, clean it. This thing's pretty dirty if you get looking in between the, the lugs with a steels ride between the clutches. There's a lot of material there. So, just standard issue cleaning. Nothing damaged beyond repair. The direct drum, if you watched yesterday's video, where I had a streak going of finding the good direct drum, this is a standard issue drum with the with this surface here with a sprag rollers ride is not round. It's got little ski slopes like I described. Uh, it will last in any street car you're probably going to build. And I've had them in drag cars before we could afford the good stuff. You're running mid fives for decades. And we never heard it. You have to start your burnout in second gear for drag racing. Second to high. Do not go first, second, third. When you shift first to second, that's when you damage that in the water box. This is also a five clutch. The actual the clutches between the forward and direct drum are interchangeable. And you can get different thickness steels trying to get the right stack. This has the, also the waved washer in it, or the Belleville washer, whatever you want to call it, that cushions the clutch pack. You typically don't see it in high performance applications in the direct drum. There is some theory I read that it's easier on the sprag but if you were to strip most of your name brand high performance transmissions, that's gone and it's been replaced by a standard flat steel and extra clutches or whatever it's going to do to make up the correct clearance. Uh, this also has a piston that's interchangeable with that one. You know, if I flip it over, this has got steel piston also. Uh, I like to find the aluminum ones, but they're getting rare. And the steels are fine. They, they work just fine. But uh, in a lot of high performance applications, you'll leave a lip seal out of there, but in this case, if you're talking stock, you uh, you take out three lip seals, you put in three lip seals. Intermediate clutches. Typically you only see three in the case. Sometimes they have the wave washer, like this one does. This will probably get replaced too. Second gear and a Turbo 400 can use some improvement, and that's some right there. It does, however, raise the stress on the snap ring. And in most high performance cases, you do not use a stock thin snap ring. You replace it with a thicker one or a spiral lock. Thank you for reminding me. When you run the high performance sprag and the other drum I spoke of yesterday in the other video, please go back and watch it. You don't reuse a standard snap ring. They also make a spiral lock, which is a 480 part. And they just retrofitted it back onto the Turbo 400 because they interchange a lot of parts. A 4L80 is just an overgrown 400 with an overdrive. A lot of the pieces in a change. Looking into this Turbo 400 I'm assembling over here. The void in this, the case right here with no lugs to support the intermediate clutches. In a high performance manual valve body application, a one that you're going to remove the forward band and won't have uh, any braking when you downshift into second. You just... You don't need it in a high performance application. So you remove the front band in place of that is a support that actually helps support the thicker snap ring you're going to install, prevent the case lugs from ripping out. Again, it's not a problem to get into really high horsepower, but it's an issue that's been addressed by the aftermarket. Back over at the transmission. Now I'm going to remove the valve body, the pock mechanism, the shift linkage, the nail. That's the actual head of the nail that sticks through the case. And runs through a groove in the linkage just to hold it from going in and out. High tech. But hey, it works. Uh, the governor tubes. 
the servo, all that junk. I typically just set it in the pan. I wipe the pan out and take all the valve body hardware and deal with it later while I'm scraping the case and cleaning all the internal parts of the transmission. It's just easier for me that way. I usually got three or four of them tore apart and I just take all the valve body stuff together and put it in there for now. And I'll deal with it when I reassemble. One more tip. I'm not sure why, but there's three quarter inch bolts holding the valve body of the case and the rest are five sixteenths. They must've done it for clearance, I guess, but remove the quarter inch bolts. There's three of them, one, two, and this one has one missing right there. Take those out first, and then as you release the 5 16 bolts, they're better suited for the spring pressure that's right there that's going to try to push the valve body away from the case. Sometimes it'll bend these as you're, doing, as you're releasing them if you wait to do those last. Just a good idea. Earlier when I saw the O-rings on the pump bolts, I thought it might be an 88 to 90. The last two years of production, they added the seventh check ball, but this is only a six check ball unit, so that's... Pretty much 65 to 88. My guess is, well, due to the metric bolts, it's from the 80s. Nothing special. You always run across clues that someone's been here before. The missing valve body bolt. Two O-rings on the filter pickup tube is a good idea. I actually do that on every one I do. But somebody's been here before me. That's fine. I had to do my typical filing. On this surface right here, this little, you can see where the rooster sits. Well, it gets raised up right here a little bit to get the linkage out through the case. But lo and behold here, there's a linkage seal. That's great. But the original one's still in the case. You gently wiggle it so it'll come out, but the linkage seal's still in the case. That's funny. But it should pull out that easy. If it doesn't, keep filing. I neglected to mention... Before I strip any transmission, I usually grab a hold of the input shaft and the output shaft and pull them in and out to kind of check the end plate just by feel to see if they're grossly out of whack. They seldom are, but it's just good to know what you're dealing with. There's selective washes on either end to adjust it, but those selective washes are hard to come by sometimes. My favorite method, getting out snap rings in the case, this is the center support snap ring. And the bolt, you know it's a center support snap ring because it's actually tapered. Is to hook it with this screwdriver that I ground a slot in right there. And get under it with the uh, big hook and just pull it out of there. That way I don't have to reach down in the case and look like a monkey. Pulling the gear train out of the case. You can lay the transmission on its back with the valve body up. And, you know, start hand passing it through to yourself. And I have uh, did that for... Well, 40 years doing it the horizontal method. But finally, I bought the J tool that snaps down over the uh, shaft, made a handle for it, and uh, now I can just grab a hold of that and whip the whole thing out one shot, and nothing's going to fall apart. It's well worth the 20, 30 bucks I paid for it. It's especially handy when I'm pulling the gear train in and out, setting the end play when I convert to a bearing instead of a thrust washer. In the back half of the case, I rollerize the output. It's a pretty cheap upgrade and uh, well worth the effort, but I sometimes have to pull it out in and out a few times, and this is slick. All right, so now the case is empty. I pulled out the rear band and the fretting washer. I'll show you that in a minute. There's a uh, selective washer that goes in those three tabs down at the bottom of the case to take the thrust, and it saves the case, so the case never sees any stress uh, the rear bushing you can see it back there if you convert into a baron i like to drive the bushing in this way just enough to kind of center the baron doesn't affect a thing that's a trick a lot of the people do this case looks really clean inside despite being pretty nasty looking on the outside this is a pretty good deal for what i paid for it you want to watch where the bolt goes through for the center support that's not all backed up but it's in good shape Let's go look at the gear set on the bench. There was definitely some weirdness going on in the back of the case. When I took it apart, I had to, quite a time getting the rear yoke off, and there was some damage to the spline way up here. Like I was able to file it out of there, and it's certainly usable, but that's strange. The spacer I just talked about in the back of the case 
and the thrust washer that rubs on it this direction. Don't worry about the black you see in there, but because that never spun, that actually goes against the output shaft. That's seen better days. It did its job, but there was some some kind of forces going on back here. Uh, this snap ring will release this output shaft if you had to convert from a four-wheel drive to a two-wheel drive or a different length, and you weren't taking the entire gear train apart, which you have to to overhaul it, you know. But if you were just sneaking an output shaft in it, you can actually lay it just like this, snap, pop that snap ring out of there. There's a bearing underneath on the end of that, three-piece bearing, but it's the only, it's three of them total in this rear gear set. And you gotta keep track of which direction everything goes. Again, where the book is handy, it'll point in the right direction. But if you're just popping the output shaft off, you can probably figure out one of them. Uh, the experts say if you have a good rear band that's not all wore out where the uh, ends are, to never give it up or replace it with a aftermarket one because these are worth the weight in gold, they claim. This is a fretting washer. Disregard that spring for a minute. It sits in the case. The cases are all the same. The center supports, some have this fretting washer to make up space right here. It sets in the case first, and then the center support sits down on top of it because they made these two different widths. I don't know why they did that, but they did. So you have to measure this distance. Again, where the book comes in handy to determine if you need a fretting washer or not. If you're putting all the parts back in the same case, it's really not a big deal. Laying down on the bottom was this spring, which looks exactly like the springs that are under that plate. This is a center support piston. It applies the immediate clutches. So there's all, uh, lip seals you need to service in there. And uh, this seems to be the normal three, one in each one. There's room for 12, but they only put one in each position every third of the way around. This says Teflon rings, which are good. Uh, usually replace them, these are scarf cut. And uh, some trans brake valve bodies insist that you run Teflon, others don't care. Uh, I'm from the school of thought that if it was running nice with the steel rings, then I'll probably put steel rings back in on the surface it was riding on. If everything's fairly new and really nice looking or brand new, I'll put the Teflon on. Uh, this is your center support. This is where the oil comes up through the center. And also, the direct is on the side. That's second in the middle. This is the surface your rear band runs on. This is normal looking right here. That rear band has to stop that from turning. There's another sprag in here uh, that usually doesn't give any trouble. Most people don't even talk about it or even know it's there. But uh, if you're really good at taking stuff apart, you can go ahead and knock this all apart and throw it in the parts washer. If you're kind of timid, you just lay it out in the direction it goes. There's not that many pieces in there, but, uh, you know, that's a good method. If you're first time doing something, just lay everything out in order. And as long as you work alone in your shop, nobody will ever bother it. Uh, most shops, so people come along and they're curious and they might come along and turn it over. And the next thing you know, well, that's not the way it goes in anymore. So, yeah, just got to be careful. And take lots of pitches, but the book will always straighten you out. So uh, now I'm on to cleaning pots, and nobody wants to see that. I actually scrape most all the grease off the case and all the everything that was external that was covered in that mung. Uh, I can scrape it off here on the bench before I put it in my pots washer, or I can fill my pots washer up with uh, debris and then have to take a whole day, pump it out, clean it out. You get what I'm saying. And a lot of people say, hey, you got a pots washer. Will you wash my completely nasty thing that I'm too lazy to uh, clean first? And I said, sure, clean it first, bring it over, I'll wash it up for you. Typically, nobody shows up. Uh, that's it for today. Please like and subscribe. Uh, another day, we'll put it back together. Thanks, but.